Hello and welcome to the two-man power trip of wrestling. My host, JP John Paz, with me today, very special guest, a former FCW heavyweight champion and tag team champion, former NXT world tag team champion, known as Prince Pretty himself, Mr. Tyler Breeze. Breezy, welcome to the two-man power trip. How are you doing? What's going on, man? How are you? Doing good. What's going on in your world? A uh, little bit of this, a little bit of that. Uh, you know, just got back out on the uh, on the independent scene. Uh, just took a couple of bookings in September uh, and October. Uh, teaching at Flatbacks, uh, doing some stuff on Up Up Down Down. A uh, little, just all over the place. What's it like getting back into the indie scene? Uh, it, it's fun, man. It's really fun. Uh, you kind of forget, and I mean, it's very different. You know, obviously coming up. Uh, the independent scene is very different than on the other side of it. Uh, but getting back out there is fun. It's fun. Uh, there's um, a lot of people out there that I've never worked with before. Um, a lot of people who are kind of hungry to get better and, and learn some stuff. And, you know, they just need the right people to work with and, and help them along with certain things. Um, so it's fun getting out there. It's fun seeing a lot of the crowd as well um, who haven't, you know, seen me for a couple of years now. So uh, they, it, it's, it's fun talking to everybody a little bit more. Cause you know, you're doing more, more of a meet and greet type of style and, and selling your merch and stuff like that. So uh, you're, you're right in there with them, which is, it's, I, I like that part. I always liked the interactions with fans and, you know, hearing about the stuff that they liked and, you know, their experiences and the first time that they saw, you know, all that type of stuff. So it's been uh refreshing, refreshing. Like you said, it is different on, on, on when you're on the way up or when you're ready where it's just a huge world known star. Mm -hmm. So like everybody knows who you are now back then it's like, okay, you're, you're trying to make your footing. So it is a completely different world. You're like the, the headliner, if you will. That, yeah, essentially, you know, like it's just, it's, it makes your job a lot easier when everybody has already watched you for 10 years on TV, yep. you know, uh, as opposed to trying to uh, get them to know you and, and get them to care about you. So uh, it's a, it, it's a good to have some equity and it, it's kind of a privilege that they, they know, you know, what you're all about and what Tyler Breeze is all about. And it's, it's just kind of cool. So uh, very different on both sides of it. With flatbacks, how do you like actually that aspect of it? Cause it, training wrestlers, I mean, that's completely different as well. Very different. And um, so I've always, you know, that's always was kind of in the, uh, the crosshairs, I guess, was to, to open a school and, and, and teach people. I've always enjoyed that part of wrestling. Um, watching the light bulb go off for people, um, you know, and and we we kind of started that, you know, even early on. Just we didn't have a school. It was just that we were taking on, you know, someone would ask you for help, and you'd start teaching them and stuff like that. So um, I always really kind of took to that part. Um, Spears is the exact same way, um, you know, where again we both are very uh, like minded thinking on on almost everything. Uh, we're very very, you know close in terms of what we teach and, and how we teach and what we believe in and stuff like that. So uh, it's kind of the perfect mix. And, uh, you know, again, switching experience levels when you get beginners, uh, it's very different. It's a very different, you know, level of learning and, and easing people in and they have no clue, you know, a lot of them what, what it's about. So uh, getting to see that aspect of it as well, it kind of, sometimes it, it just brings you back to the basics um, where, you know, you, you, why did you start wrestling? Why did you want to get into it? You know, and it, it reminds you of why exactly we do this when you take all of the, of the crap out of it. You know what I mean? You just leave it as wrestling. A buddy of mine, Dr. Tom Pritchard invited me down to a JPWA last year and he was teaching them like back to basics. And like, as a fan, you know, I'm sitting ringside, I'm watching him like teach the guys and he's actually getting in there with them doing mm -hmm. this stuff. So, but it's like, so interesting. It's like, wow, I didn't even realize he's like, no, do it this way. And when he's doing, it, I was like, wow, it like makes perfect sense. Like, but he's like, you got to have the basics down before you start creating this character and doing your own thing back to basic. Like, just like you said, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's one of those things, especially now, um, we're getting, it's so funny. You just sound like an old timer, you know what I mean? Of, yeah. of everybody likes the, you know, the crazy moves and all the cool stuff. And, you know, a lot of people can do it. A lot of people can do it really well. Um, but if you don't establish all the stuff before that, and that's what you're relying on, then one, uh, somewhere, somewhere down the line, someone's going to be able to do it better than you. You know what I mean? Even if I could do a really cool 450, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure Ricochet or Osprey can do better than me. So it's like, all right, well, I'm going to be either the second or third best at this thing, or, you know, I'm going to make them care about everything I do along the way and care about me as the character and me as the person and stuff like that. So you really can't skip the fundamentals and the basics. And if it breaks down, you know, something happens in the match, it's always nice to, to have something to, to fall back on, rely on those basics. That, that's exactly right. You can always kind of find your way in and out of any situation because – 
uh, the basics are such second nature to you that you don't freak out. Um, where again, in front of a crowd, they can be pretty unforgiving and they can tear you apart if you look like you don't know what you're doing, even though you do. And you, and obviously you know this from wrestling and, I, and I've seen it, but it's like where to fit in some of that stuff. And some of the guys you see today, it's like, ah, oh, it doesn't make sense. Like, you, you know, you, you got to know where to fit it in and when to do those, those moves. Well, that's in a lot of it too, is like, you know, uh, again, one of the biggest things that we kind of jump into is the whys behind everything. Like it's mm -hmm. not so much, you know, a super kick. Okay. A super kick is a move. Anybody can do it. It can mean nothing or it can be, you know, somebody's finisher. But why are we doing it? And why are we doing it at this time to this person and the whole, you know, scenario around it? What happened before it? What's happening after it? Like, look deeper than just the surface level. Oh, that was a really cool move or that was a really cool idea or whatever. You need to always go deeper and ask yourself why until you kind of run out of the whys. Can you believe like looking at that you're a trainer? You know what I mean? Like, it's like, wow, I, I, I can't believe the, the time has passed and now it's flipped <laughs> almost. You know what I mean? It, yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're asking if, you know, time flies, it sure does. Uh, you know, even, even the fact that I've been wrestling for 15 years is pretty insane. Um, you know, it just, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's you blink, you blink your eyes and all of a sudden you've traveled the world and, you know, wrestled in the biggest company in the world for 10 years. It's kind of, uh, yeah, it, it's weird, man. You got to kind of, it, it sounds so odd and, and you don't know it. You know, I could explain it to a younger me and I still wouldn't do it. Um, where you just got to stop and smell the roses, man. You got to enjoy the journey and enjoy the ride because in a blink of an eye, it's gone, man. Whether you, you know, decided to stop or whether it's taken from you, it, it happens soon. Now, were you reach, um, at the uh, performance center recently training down there? Were you a uh, coach? Yeah, I've done a couple guest coaching spots. Oh, what was that like? What was that experience like? Fun. Very fun. Uh, again, it's, it's just, I've always enjoyed the, the teaching of people, <laughs> um, the cool part about that is it's very different than <laughs> flatbacks because flatbacks, we, we, you know, we deal with some advanced people as well. And, and the people that go through our course, you know, we, we go on to the next step with them, but in the performance center, it's very different because now you're getting paid to do this for a living. And, <laughs> so uh, I, was, I wonder if she does this and she did it um you were saying about it's different at the performance center getting paid yes you know, yes the, so the performance center is different and, and it's it, again it's a kind of a change of pace where um the the students there are actually getting paid to do this now and, and it's their career they've taken a you know further step into what this is so getting the chance to train them and and go into kind of that next step of of, you know, tomorrow you could be on NXT TV and, you know, you could get called up to Raw or SmackDown, which has happened a lot of the times. Um, that just goes into even deeper of a, of a training that, you know, we don't necessarily get into in flatbacks uh, until they get to that point. Um, so it's kind of cool. You're kind of covering like, you know, all the little aspects of of training people and, and moving along with their careers. How does that happen where they actually to come in and do it? Is that just like, hey, you just get a phone call and they want you there? Yeah, yeah, for the most part. But is it is it anybody specific? Is it uh, Bloom? Like who, who is the 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 person that's uh, kind of bringing you in? Oh, uh, it's kind of a combo effort um, of just like a hey, you you free this week? Yeah, I'm free this week. Cool. And then all of a sudden it appears on on your schedule. You know what I mean? So to me, it's like the perfect guy. It's like okay, you know, who's on WB TV? He knows how the production works. He knows how the you know what I mean? It's like the perfect guy to to bring in. Well, and that was a good combination. You know what I mean? It's like. I always used to say it like this, where, you know, the reason why I was in WWE for so long or, you know, even even down at NXT for the last couple of years um, was because, you know, I've, I've been through the system. I know what, you know, FCW was like. I know what NXT was like. I was, a you know, I kind of found my my footing, you know, going up through NXT and kind of being a homegrown talent and being, you know, at, during the peak of it and everything else. So I understand what the coaches are looking for. I understand what Rod SmackDown is looking for. I understand what Hunter and, and, you know, everybody's looking for. So, you know, uh, again, I've, it's, it's not so much, you know, saying that I know more than the average person or that I was a better wrestler or anything like that. It's just more along the lines of, I can help navigate that system because I had to, you know what I mean? As it's, it's, I, I always used to kind of put it like that where like Shawn Michaels is great. He knows so much stuff. He's an awesome, you know, uh, coach producer uh you know in charge of everything but he never had to go through an nxt system 
And again, that can get confusing for some people and having someone who's gone through that before um, can kind of go, oh, okay. Like, yeah, that makes sense. You know, this is what's being said or, or this is, you know, I'm, I'm kind of confused at this point. What would you do in this scenario? And it, it helps kind of, again, been there, done that. So it, it, it makes a big difference in terms of helping coach someone else. Yeah, like the experience factor. You you can literally speak from your own experience and help guide them through. And hopefully they have, you know, a nice long run like you had. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And again, you know, like the performance center is so great because there's so much talent there. There's so much, you know, not only is there so much talent, like young talent that are looking to make a career at this, but you also have the wealth of knowledge that is all the coaches. Um, you know, and 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 like I said, Sean, Sean is uh, you know, I loved when he became a part of NXT. Um, you know, I was picking his brain all the time, you know, and even at that point, you know, I, I, I'd been up on Raw, I'd been on SmackDown, I'd been on WrestleMania, so I know what, you know, WWE was all about and I knew it, but I still couldn't help but just sit there and go, hey man, you know, what do you, what, what do you remember about this time? Or what was this like? Or, you know, what were you thinking at this time? And, you know, I remember just talking to him because I, luckily I got to talk to um, Stone Cold Steve Austin about this as well and their match at WrestleMania. And I remember talking to both of them because it's it's one of those matches that I use as a teaching tool all the time um, and, and just one of those ones that really solidified that I wanted to do this as a career. And so getting the chance to talk to each of them individually and, and get their thoughts of what, you know, what they were thinking during the match, everything else, again, like they're just if, – if you're there, if you're hired at the Performance Center and you're not picking their brain daily, like, man, you are wasting your time because they could just – they could tell you everything you ever want to know. You know what I mean? And again, you can just appreciate it years and years and years later where you go, oh man, I still have questions for you. Um, again, because, you know, if you ever watched my stuff, I was influenced heavily by Sean. And so getting a chance to talk to him and, you know, again, he's, he's in charge there now to, to where he's running the show. So he, he just, you gotta, you gotta utilize the, the people that are around you. And again, that have been, been there and done that. What do you think is like the best piece of advice HBK gave to you? Um, so it was interesting. So me and Sean, we, mo most of the time we talked as opposed to, you know, him giving me advice. He always had, you know, critique on certain things or, hey, man, maybe this instead of this or maybe this instead of this. And we would kind of talk that way. But it wasn't so much. And I think it was more, again, because I already went through the system and I was kind of on the other side helping other you know, kids. And so it was more of like, a, Hey man, we're really trying to work on this with this guy. Can you help him with that? And I'd go, yeah, sure. And I, luckily I was on TV to help him live on TV. Um, but so it was less, you know, it was less about helping me, I guess. And more of just like a, Hey man, like, you know, you know what you're doing, you know, help this guy now. And, and you, what do you think of this and blah, blah, blah. And so it was uh, kind of cool being on that level of things. You know what I mean? When you look at it too, I mean, he's like the perfect guy. He's been the WrestleMania main event or Mr. WrestleMania. He's like the perfect guy to kind of pick his brain and say, "Hey, you know, what can I do here? What can I get to that level? You know, what should I do here?" I mean, he he's been there, done that, literally every well, every. Time. Yeah, and it's different too. I mean, you know, obviously putting aside the fact that he's one of the best to ever do it, um, there's two paths usually that I explain. You know, when you're getting into wrestling, and you're either in one path or the other. You can never be in both. So you're either in a Brock Lesnar type of path where you're just a one in a million, no matter what, like you could, you could, you know, you'd have to mess up pretty bad to not be successful because you're just going on that path and the company views you in a certain way. And they're like, man, this guy is going to succeed. Like, that's just how it goes. Or you go the other path and that's when you're around uh, and, and maybe you're not the top guy. Maybe you're not used all the time, but you're around and then you're around and you're around. And, you know, the guys who are kind of going the other path, they go up and they fall off and they go up and they fall off and they go up and they fall off. But 10 years down the line, I still remember this guy because I grew up watching him and all the other guys are gone. So then once you get to that moment, then you start to, you know, they almost start to realize what they have in you. And you've seen that happen with a bunch of different guys like Dolph Ziggler's, um, the Kofi Kingston's, the Daniel Bryan's, the Jeff Hardy's. Like that's kind of when you get to that time um it is when you really kind of figure out who you are and, and sean again you know because he became you know one of the best of all times if you look at it it took him a long time to become the heartbreak kid it took him around 10 years to become the heartbreak kid same as bret hart you know they started out in tag teams they started to kind of get their feet wet as, as singles competitors but they bret did not become the hitman until you know at least 10 years deep and it's just because again that's just they weren't 
you know, at that time they were the smaller guys or whatever it was that made them go down that path. But, you know, after they, you know, figured out who they were and what they were and how they're going to be marketed, man, like there's no denying them. You know what I mean? That's a perfect way to kind of encapsulate it there with the two paths. That is so true. Cause like Brett, he's going through the system. He's a tag guy. Then he's an IC guy. Then he's the world guy. And he kind of comes into his own and, and you see that quiet charisma HBK. It's literally almost like yep. the same path. Yeah. And that, so yeah. Great. Yeah. If you look at it and again, you know, like I use a, a Jeff Hardy is the same thing. Jeff didn't really change much from like, you know, initial Jeff Hardy to when he became the champion on SmackDown. He didn't really change. He was, he was Jeff Hardy. But he'd been around and he'd been reliable and he'd been performing. And any time that they called on him, he he was there. You know what I mean? And so it's the same with Brett. Like it, Brett was good. Brett was good when he was in the tag team. Brett was good on his own. And then when they finally went, you know what? You're good. Then he became the hitman. Then he did all stuff. Sean, the same way. You know what I mean? It's, it's just you. It's very clear who those guys are. And again, you know, uh, Kofi is a, is a fantastic version of it too, where Kofi – Yes, he's changed a little bit here and there, but the general idea of, of Kofi Kingston, he was great when he started, and then he was great when he did the whole Kofi Mania thing, but it, it takes time for them to realize and go, oh, oh, we got this guy over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah let's do that. You know what I mean? Where, again, some guys will come in and it's, Whoop, this is happening right now, right this second, and you know, in your first year, you kind of conquer the world. Yep. And a guy like Hofi or even Ziggler, it's like Mr. Dependable. It's like, okay, we need this guy in the first match. Okay, now we need a main eventer. You know, like it's that's, like one yes. of those guys, like MVP that, type guys. Yeah, and that's that's the biggest thing is, you know, because a lot of guys will get frustrated in that in that role or in that spot where they'll go, man, when is my time? When is my time? When is my time? And the thing that I figured out was that it sounds ridiculous, but I was told uh, by Norman Smiley. I was in FCW and I was driving myself nuts. And he went, you know what your problem is? And I said, what? He goes, you care too much. And I said, what do you mean? I said, how can I not care about my dream job, man? Like, all I want to do is be here. And he goes, you'll understand what I mean one day. And I understood eventually years down the line to where you have to care enough so that if they call on you and they call you off the bench, you have to look good. Your gear has to look good. You better be able to hit your times. You better be able to deliver in the ring. And you need to be able to check all those boxes. But if they don't pick you that day, you also have to be perfectly fine going, okay, I'm on the bench waiting for you. Whenever you need me, I'm right here. And that's, if you can figure out that balance, then those are the guys who really kind of succeed. Because again, if, if you don't get your number called, if you're sitting on that bench, then you will just get miserable and bitter and go, I should get this and I should get this. And why isn't this happening? And you go, it's just not your time, man. It's going to happen. And when they, when they, when they call you, you better be able to knock it out of the park. Otherwise they ain't calling you again. You know what I mean? So you have to care enough to kill it every single time you get the chance. But if you don't get that opportunity today, then it'll happen tomorrow and you got to be okay with it. Man, what great advice from Norman Smiley. Uh, I'm telling you, man. The and, big I, wiggle. and at the wow. time, I did not understand it at all. I went, what do you mean? How can I not care? You know what I mean? But <laughs> it just it, it goes to show you. The big wiggle coming up with the, the big advice. It's awesome. Oh, he's the best. He's the best. I love Norman. Man, he he's uh it was always fun to watch too as a fan. I just love that uh, that almost like quiet charisma. And then all of a sudden he starts doing that dance, and you're like, oh, yeah. I love this guy. Well, and it's, just, so, it's always so funny, you know. I mean, he always slides under the radar for the stuff that he did. But one of the best, you know, technical wrestlers, you know, that that there's ever been. If you watch some of his he's stuff, a legit shooter, unbelievable, so smooth, so technical, everything's so good. Um, but and he'll tell you, he goes, nobody cared more than when I became, you know, screaming Norman. And I went, dude, I'm telling you, the Screaming Norman stuff was a masterpiece. It was great. And it's just so funny that, you know, the one of the one of the the most smoothest technical wrestlers ever was also screaming in hockey gear. And that was when they started to care about it. It was great. Isn't that funny? It's like, OK, he does all awesome stuff in Japan. He's shooting. He's doing awesome stuff in Mexico. He's like a great uh, British, um, you mm -hmm. know, chain wrestler. And then all of a sudden he puts on the hockey gear and then the uh -huh. football helmet and everyone loves him as Screaming Norman. Oh, it's crazy. It's, yeah, it's great. Fantastic. It's almost a little bit like your story a little bit because, I mean, you had a million names before, right, in, in, in FCW and, and, and yeah. NXT. And then when Tyler Breeze comes, it's almost like the, the light bulb goes off and it's like, wow, the character that people care about and, and, and can relate with and literally say, OK, that guy is a cocky a-hole uh, with mm -hmm. the selfie stick and the phone. Yep. And uh, yeah, and that's exactly it. And you, you kind of see that light bulb go off for a lot of different guys at a lot of different times. So like Stone Cold Steve Austin, perfect example. You know, stunning Steve Austin, great wrestler. Well, it, it, sometimes, you know, even if you want to compare it, 
better wrestler than Stone Cold Steve Austin. Way better. It was, yeah. You know, it, it was just, yep. it, it was what it was. You used to watch his matches with Ricky the Dragon Steamboat and stuff like that. Very talented, very good. But he started to figure out, like, I remember, I think he even asked Ricky, like, what do I need? What am I missing here? And Ricky was like, honestly, man, like, in ring, you're good. Like, this, it's not really one of those things. You just got to find what catches. And until he found Stone Cold Steve Austin, then all of a sudden, it's like the light bulb goes off and you went, just because you know all this wrestling and all this cool stuff doesn't mean you have to do it all the time. You do it at the right times. And, and, and what really matters is, again, getting people to care about you. Um, and you watched it happen with Rocky Maivia. All of a sudden, Rocky Maivia, who's getting chanted, you know, die, Rocky, die, becomes the rock and starts dropping an elbow and everything else. And all of a sudden, he stops doing, you know, all of the wrestling that he can do. He's perfectly capable of doing it. But the light bulb goes off and he went, oh. They care a lot more if I'm, you know, figuring out this character and I'm making them care about whether it's just an elbow drop or whatever he's doing. You know what I mean? Um, and, and again, I was no different. Sean, Sean was the exact same thing. Um, you know, even um, we talk about it all the time, but Sean Spears, when he became Ty Dillinger, same thing. Ty Dillinger was was in a tag team with Jason Jordan, um, I think for, oh my God, maybe a year, two years, and just could not find his footing. And then finally found the perfect 10 thing. And it was just, you know, again, the light bulb goes off. You went, oh, I'm really not changing a lot. I'm the exact same person. But now I've put the spin on it to where people care about it. Um, and again, you know, Tyler Breeze was no different. I could I could wrestle. I could do all the stuff you need me to do. But nobody cared at all um, until I went, you know what? Okay, let's try this. And I tried it. And it was the complete opposite of what I'd done because I literally just wanted to wrestle, 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 wrestle. And finally, I figured out, well, let's just not wrestle at all. Let's just do the other stuff. And as soon as I started that, I went, oh man, this is way better. And then I just added just enough wrestling when they cared about it um, to get me where I needed to go. Uh, and again, just that that light bulb moment, uh, it's tough, man. Some people, it takes a while to find. Some people get it right away and some people never find it. Uh, but you can kind of tell if you look at somebody's an overall span of their career, you really see when the light bulb goes off and they start to get it. I always think of Hogan, Hulk Hogan, like about that too. It's like, okay. And then Austin and rock too, obviously to equal level, but it's like, yeah. they were almost like punch kick guys, not doing it, too yeah. much wrestling. It was, it was basically their character. I mean, people were obsessed. If Hogan won or lost, they wanted, like they lived and breathed through it. Austin. They did not want him to lose rock. You know what I mean? That's what it was about. It wasn't necessarily about, Oh, he's got to hit the move. Sure. You, they had a couple of the, the greatest hits that people yeah. love, but it was all about them. It didn't matter like Hogan in Japan doing all, you know, cool stuff that he, nope, doesn't matter here. That Yeah, that's exactly right. Like Hogan's a perfect example. If you watch his stuff from Japan, I mean, he's throwing in Zaguri's and he can, he can do all this stuff. Just because he can do it doesn't mean that he has to. So when he figures it out, then he figures out that, oh, if I sell, then people care about me. And now when I punch somebody in the face, they care. And he's like, okay, it's cool. I figured it out. And that's, again... It's, it's, it's the light bulb moment, I guess is the easiest way. And, you know, even when we're trying to explain to, um, to, to our students, like it's not the move, it's never the move, you know, again, Hogan dropped a leg drop. You know? yeah. Now people are doing backflip leg drops and, you know, 450 leg drops. Like it doesn't matter. It, it's every time that you do something, they're going to care about it. Randy Orton, how many people do, you know, flipping cutters and springboard cutters and all these different cutters. Nobody cares because, when Randy does it, it's yeah. the RKO and they care, right? Yeah. And again, that's, it, 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 it takes time to establish that. It takes time to get that. But it's just so important and it, it outweighs everything. And even my son, who who loves The Rock, it's just so funny. He says, like, the people's elbow, he thinks, you know, he's eight years old, he knows nothing, but he thinks the people's elbow is, like, the most devastating move of all time. <laughs> it's, it's literally an elbow. You know what right. I mean? Well, and the funny part is if you watch back, like, early Rock when he's in the Nation of Domination, he starts doing the people's elbow and watch mm. the people. Nobody cares at all. They just think it's, you know, it's whatever. It's an elbow drop. Okay, cool. And then like a year later, watch the people. The second that he kicks that arm, they start getting out of their chairs, man. It's insane. Yes. And it's just, he's, he's what an example of, you know, figuring out what works and figuring out that we work the crowd. It's not, you know, we're not wrestling a match. We're working a crowd and that's, getting them to do what we want at a certain time by using your emotions. And we happen to be in a wrestling ring. So we add in a couple of wrestling moves, but it's not the wrestling moves that, that they care about. It's 
it's the rock. They care about the rock and anything that he does. It doesn't matter what that move is, whether it's an elbow drop or anything, they're going to care about it because it's him and he's invested in that. And he figured that out. And if people, you know, follow in that kind of template, then they get the same success. Now with the breeze character, who comes up with that? Cause that's so much different. It's so creative. It's almost like, a, I don't even know how to describe it. It's almost like, um, like a social media kind of influencer mm -hmm. guy me, mixed with like a, a Hollywood, like a celebrity. You know yeah. what I mean? It's, it, it, I mean, you could kind of define it easily, but it's almost like a few things mixed together. It very much is. And that's, you know, almost every character is going to be, you know, unless you're just like a blatant ripoff or something. Um, but everybody copies everybody to an extent. Like you, you're going to be a combination of two or three guys. That's just how it is. So again, you know, when I was Mike Dalton, I was, you know, just kind of wrestling and doing, you know, the usual stuff when you're trying to figure it out. And because, you know, that wasn't working when I tried the Tyler Breeze stuff, I literally went the complete opposite. I went, you know what? Maybe I'm going to try a character that doesn't know how to wrestle. Maybe he knows nothing. Maybe he's just like these people that I see coming in for tryouts who are models or actors or athletes. And they come in and they go, ah, oh, wrestling's easy. I can do this. But they don't know anything. And it's not their fault. It's just there's almost like a comedic effect to that where you go, you have no clue what you're getting into. Um, but there could be a character in that. So I went super far that way. I literally, uh, Zoolander was the first reference. So I wanted to right. be a male model, but yep. you know, I wasn't going to be like Rick Martell. Um, I wasn't going to be like any of these types of things before I wanted to go Zoolander because I loved how Zoolander was kind of an idiot and you know, <laughs> yeah. you're kind of untouchable. When you go into that category of being kind of like the funny idiot, you're untouchable. You can do whatever you want. Yep. And you know, so I went, okay, he's going to be Zoolander. He doesn't know how to wrestle at all. And that was the initial archetype and the, the initial like uh, video that I made to pitch his character. And when they went, there might be something here. Then I started to expand on it even more by like, okay, he's a, yeah, he's a full idiot. Let's make him like, he knows nothing about wrestling. Uh, he knows nothing about, you know, anything. He just knows that he likes when the cameras are on him and he was a model and that's it. And so I'm obsessed with myself and, and that was kind of it. And I, I started off looking into a mirror. So I'd go, all right, I pull out a mirror and I'd get distracted talking to you because I'd look at myself and I'd go, oh my God. Have you guys seen me like this is good. You know what I mean? And so then, then once I started doing that a little bit, uh, I, I think it was the coaches who went, well, you know, in the end, like, how does this guy, when he's in the ring, how is he going to be? And, he, and I said, well, you know, I'm thinking maybe he doesn't know how to wrestle. And they went, ah, I, you need to know enough to get through a match. And I went, okay, you're right. So I started looking at, you know, the other types of things that I wanted to add to it. And I started looking like all kind of all across the board. So, you know, Shawn Michaels was obviously a big, uh, inspiration because his his style was more of what i went for anyway because he was you know a little bit more athletic he was you know jumping around all over the place he was very fast um you know similar size stuff like that so i i kind of leaned more towards his style as opposed to like a stone cold steve austin who was bigger and he was a brawler and stuff like that i couldn't really do that so i, I leaned more towards sean um and and you know even going back to like the the initial heartbreak kid um character when they were you know when he was coming around with with sherry and you know they had the mirrors and everything i that's where i took the mirror from and i just took a little bit of like that that uh i guess that uh style that he had and then i i looked back way back to to a guy named gorgeous george who oh, yeah. was very much about the pageantry and again at that time wrestling was a lot simpler so they weren't you know dumping each other on their heads or doing these crazy moves because they they couldn't it was a the, the ring was terrible it was a boxing ring and everything else so um the what i liked about him was was the, his entrance and how he came out and he had you know he, everything was so elaborate and elegant and everything else and so i took some pieces from him and i went i'm gonna do that exact same thing um you know just a modernized version of it so all of a sudden you have a little bit of sean a little bit of gorgeous george a little bit of zoolander um and then you know obviously as the character grows it evolves so you know having to wrestle longer matches or different styles of matches or maybe a main event as opposed to something else um then i start to figure out you know i'm one of the smaller guys i'm probably not going to be picking up and slamming a lot of guys so what am i going to do what is my offense um and i figured out that if i can you know find different ways to kick people in the face it works so i can do that to anybody and you know again that's where you kind of i took a little bit of owen hart um you know where is is in seguris and his spinning heel kick and all that stuff took a little bit of that um you know just again, looking at guys, similar size, similar style and piecing together what the Tyler Breeze character would end up being. Um, yeah. It took a little bit, a little bit of everything. Very cool. Like when a guy takes something you know, from Zoolander, something that people like can relate to, sure. but not be 
like a rip a rip off. You know what I mean? Like obviously the Road Warriors, everyone knows that movie, The Road Warrior, mm-hmm. but do they know it's Wes? Do they know it's Lord Humongous? Like they they kind of know, but but it's like a you know what I mean? It's like a part yeah. of that. So you're kind of taking from it so people can relate to it, but it's completely different in, in its own way. For sure. And I mean, that's just one of those things. Again, nothing, especially now, like, man, you'd be hard to, it'd be very hard to come up with something original. You know, you're yep. going to take something from somebody. Um, you're just going to put your different spin on it and, and, and switch it. You know what I mean? So with, with Zoolander being the inspiration, you know, again, it was just kind of like, all right, well, He's a model. That's the part that I can kind of take from him. And his overall, I loved the fact that he was like, uh, uh, not the smartest or, or, you know, just a little bit, he'd say stuff and you go, wait, what did he just say? Like, is that a thing? And I really kind of always leaned towards, you know, obviously as you watched, you know, as we got into the fashion files and stuff like that, um, I always leaned towards the comedy side of things. And especially it was almost like a challenge because a lot of people would almost look down on comedy or go, you know, ah, you know, I, I remember hearing early on, you know, people would say, like, ah, funny doesn't make money. And I just kind of laugh and go, uh, I don't know. Everybody likes like stand up comedy and comedy movies and everything else. Is it like, there's definitely a spot here for comedy. Um, and you know, I, I had the most success leaning towards that to where a lot of the Tyler Breeze interviews and stuff like that, there was a bunch of comedy in it. Um, you know, even all the way up until when I teamed with Dango and became the fashion police and did the fashion files and everything else, there was comedy written all over all of this stuff because in the end, everybody wants to be entertained, man. They, do, they don't understand, you know, uh, the wrestling like we do. We love wrestling so much that we want to be wrestlers, but they, they can't relate to, you know, certain wrestling moves, but they can always relate to either being laughed at or laughing with somebody or laughing, you know, it's just, it's, it's an easy thing to attach to. And I don't, I don't think a lot of people can do it. You know, people who are good at it, Santino, Santino was just yep. fantastic at it. And you can't tell me that that wasn't successful. And uh, that guy, The Rock, kind of made a nice little living doing a lot of the pretty good. comedic stuff. Yeah, pretty good at that. Yeah. Even the like the slow burning with Kevin Kelly calling him like a Hermie and mm-hmm. like, all you know, all that just like little jibs and jabs and stuff. Uh, Kurt Angle, when he was a serious oh. wrestler, people didn't take him as seriously. All of a sudden he showed his comedic side. Yep through the roof through the well, and, and that's the funny part too and kurt especially like kurt was just a phenomenon but it, when he leaned into the fact that you know he actually wanted to be booed and disliked and be the butt of the joke then he became a star man then you you love to see him on tv and again not you know you knew that you were going to be entertained um and he was just the perfect mix of uh he'll make you laugh and then he'll get you involved in his match because you care about him. You know what I mean? So yep. he's a perfect example of, you know, not afraid to really look like the idiot and not really afraid to, you know, say some dumb stuff and just, just really give into what this is. And Daniel Bryan, when you look at it, probably one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, uh-huh. maybe the best wrestler on the roster when you guys had him. The thing that got him over was the hell no stuff, the stuff with Kane, the stuff with uh, Dr. Shelby, the comedy stuff. That's when people started really to take notice of him. That's exactly right. And that's, you know, another one of those things that you try to explain to, to students or, or to people trying to get in this. Like, if you're going to try to go, and, and we've had people who are like, oh, I'm going to be, you know, the the best wrestler in the world, or I'm going to be the, you know, the technical wrestler. I'm going to be a wrestler's wrestler. Okay, cool, man. But like, you're you're not going to do it better than Brian. Like Brian, you know, he, he went that route and he built a name for himself to us, to a certain extent. But then when he made it to WWE, he realized very quickly that that's not enough. Like that was okay. But what really, you know, made it click for him is when he started giving into the stuff with Kane and, you know, the the Daniel Bryan yes, no stuff. And like yeah. all that stuff really, again, the exact same Bryan. But now people are filling up an arena for him. And then he went, man, this is way cooler, you know. And, and again, he still got to main event WrestleMania, wrestled twice on Mania. You know what I mean? He got to yeah. do everything he ever wanted. Yep. Um, you just have to realize that, again, they need a, a reason to latch on to you. Yep. And even like the Tyler Breeze character, it has range. You know what I mean? It's not just one, one side. Like this, like, like this guy is interesting. There's more to him. Like, like now, now all of a sudden he's got the, the selfie. Like what is, what is up with this guy? You know what I mean? Like he's got a little bit of range to his character. Well, yeah. And then they, um, you know, I think they saw, uh, all the different variety of stuff that we were able to do. So they wrote some fantastic stuff for me to when, when I came in, it went, okay, you know, this is a cool idea. Um, but, there's probably a, a shelf life on this. 
And once we kind of kept pushing it and pushing it and pushing it, then we realized that there really wasn't like you could put me, you know, in, in the opener or you could put me in the main or you could make me wrestle Liger or you could make me wrestle for the title or you could put the title on me. You can do whatever you want. And that character will work, um, you know, anywhere across the board. And that just shows you where variety is. Um, and I remember Triple H talking to me about that, just kind of telling me like, hey, man, look, like wrestling is a variety show. It's a variety show. Not everybody you know, needs to be the killer monster, the serious guy, whatever. He goes, if you can, you know, make yourself versatile, then you'll be, you'll be booked forever. I'll be on, you know, you'll, you'll be on every show because they're, they're, people always need that. They always need, again, either the opener or the, the comedy, comedy relief or a buffer or the main event or whatever. And if you can do all that, my God, I could pay you all day. Um, Cause you're an asset to a company. What was your relationship like with Triple H? Very good. Very good. So, um, when the Tyler Breeze stuff started to hit, uh, it was, it, it got a little bit closer, you know, to that point, I, I just kind of been another guy, you know, just in, it lost in the shuffle and I never, I talked to him, but uh, there was never really a reason to care about me. And when I started doing the Tyler Breeze stuff, uh, then he really kind of went, all right, like I see he's having fun with it. I see he's starting to kind of figure this out. Um, and I remember the first real time, um, I think they saw a glimpse of it. Uh, there was like an eight man tag or something with like the Ascension and, and Juice Robinson and uh, Corey Graves and stuff. And the match almost ended up spotlighting me a little bit to where, you know, uh, I stole it with how ridiculous this character was. And that was where they went, Oh, there might be something here. And leading up all the way until I had my, that first takeover match with Sami Zayn. Um, and I remember Hunter pulling me aside and just saying, Hey man, look like, we thought this idea for the character, we thought the character may, might work here and there. It might be like a fun little thing in the show. And he goes, but this was the test to kind of see if there was legs to this. And he goes, there's legs to this. Like we can do anything with this now. And I went, cool, man. And from there again, it just, we got uh, closer and, and just, you know, even because I think at that point it was maybe 2013. So there was another two years after that where I figured out, you know, what I was kind of doing and everything else. And we were always cool. He was always hands-on with stuff, very approachable, very easy. And I think he knew kind of what he had in me to where he could rely on me. And it got to that point where he just didn't really have to worry about it. You know, I, I remember even going for an NXT show and uh, I think it was leading up to Liger maybe. And I had a match and then I was supposed to have a promo after. And uh, I found out I was doing the promo, like as I was about to make my entrance and I went, they went, yeah, yeah, the match in the promo. And I said, am I cutting a promo? And they said, yeah. And I said, what, what do you want me to say? And they went, ah, you know, the deal, like, you, you know, you know what you got, just, just you go with it. And I went, okay. And they just, I, I just went, man, that's like a badge of honor. Cause they trust you on, on live yeah. TV to do this. And I went, man, that's really cool. Um, to where it shows, you know, that you built that cause they don't just give it to you. You got to earn it and, you know, earning that, uh, that much leeway or that, you know, ah, we're not worried about you. We, we know what we got. That's pretty cool, uh, to, to be that, you know? Yeah, that's like the ultimate sign of trust there. Like, hey, mm -hmm. just go out there and, and do your thing. We, we we believe in you. That's right, yeah. The Liger thing, too, to me, obviously, Jushin's under Liger, one of the all-time greats, just an absolute legend, not a part of WB, not, you know, doesn't have a contract. He's just <laughs> a kind of a legend uh, coming in to do an awesome NXT TakeOver Brooklyn show. So to me, that's like, okay, who do we trust with this guy? Who can it, it the match look good? Who can make Liger look good? But it'd it be believable, like, if Liger lost. Yep. So it's one of those things where, like, it's like the perfect storm, and they pick you, which is, like, the perfect example of, of trust. Yeah, yeah, and that's that was, you know, uh, one of those things where again, at the time, like that was NXT was really at a peak, um, where I think Brooklyn was actually like, we, we'd kind of hit these little milestones along the way where, you know, we were filling up full sale and we were, you know, putting on a little show and people were starting to care about the talent, but we really didn't know what we had. We just knew that, you know, maybe there was something special here. And then all of a sudden we did the show in, um, uh, California with WrestleMania where, you know, we ended up having, I think like four or 5,000 people there and they went, Oh man. Okay. There's like, I think they were, they, I think I remember talking to somebody and they said they were only expecting about a thousand, like, Oh, let's see if we can get a thousand people. And you know, mania is happening anyway. People are in town. Maybe we can get a thousand and they kept putting out chairs and we ended up getting like 5,000 people. And then they wow. went, wow. Okay. I think there's something even more here. And then Brooklyn came around and that was when we filled up the arena um, where literally the next night was going to be SummerSlam. And we filled at the exact same arena with no, there was no Raw or SmackDown guys on it. It was all 100% NXT talent. And they just went, 
wow, okay, there's something really here. So we were hitting on all cylinders and, you know, the tag division was hot. The women's division was hot. The, the men's division was hot. Everything was really good. And I think you, you'll see a lot of parallels with like what AEW is doing or what they were doing where, you know, you're, you're almost, uh, there's no limits and you can kind of branch out to these other things that you didn't think were possible. Um, and it just makes the product seem so much cooler to where you go, what? Like Liger's not even in WWE and now he's on a takeover, which that can't yeah. be right. What, what is happening here? And like, you never thought you would see it and now you're seeing it. And, and that's what that NXT uh, feeling was at the time yeah. to where, again, it was just, we, we could do no wrong. People were partying all night. Like they were just having a blast at these shows. And uh, again, you'll see a lot of parallels to what, uh, when AEW came around, they did the exact same thing. All the NXT crowd it just went to the AEW show, and that was yep. the same feeling to where they'd forgive anything. They just were having a blast and partying all show and everything else. And um, it was just really cool to to kind of be a part of that. And again, something like that, that once in a lifetime, the only match that Liger ever had in WWE and being trusted with that, and, you know, you're going to take care of this guy and also do exactly what business we're, we're hoping to accomplish here. Um yeah, yeah, no pressure, but uh, it, was, it was pretty cool, you know? <laughs> That's uh, a little bit of pressure there, but kind of shocking in, in the same way that, like, wow, like, Liger? What the, like, what in the world? Where is this coming from? Like, there's no New Japan uh, yeah. WWE deal that we know of? Like, you know, it's crazy. Well, and that's, yeah. And so I thought it was a joke at first because um, nobody would really tell me. Like, I think wow. at that point, I basically wrestled everybody. Um, I've been on, you know, almost every takeover wrestling everybody. So I think at that time, I looked at the landscape and I went, all right, well, this guy's with this guy and this guy's going there and this guy's doing this and this guy. So there's nobody really around. So, like, I'm probably not going to be on takeover, I guess. And um, I remember, I think Hunter even said, like, hey, we're, we're working on something for you. Just, you know, you'll be on it. Just, just, you know, don't worry. And I said, yeah, no worry. We're good. And um, Finn. Finn Balor was the first one who came up to me and he went, Hey man, he goes, uh, do you know you're wrestling Liger at takeover? And I said, what do you mean Liger? Like who's Liger? Is he like a new guy or like, you know, surely you're not talking about, you know, the legend that doesn't work here. And he right. went, yeah, no, no, no. Like, like Liger, Liger. And I said, really? And he goes, yeah. And I said, you're messing with me. And he goes, no, no, no. He goes, he trained me. He goes, he was one of my trainers. So he said they had me reach out to him and see if he'd be open to it. And I went, really? And he said, yeah. And he goes, yeah. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. And he said, you didn't know? And I said, I had no clue. Nobody's told me anything. And um, so then when it rolled around, I think a couple weeks later, they went, hey, you're going to you know, do this match. And then you're you're going to be calling out. Or, or Regal, I think, was going to come out and tell you that you're wrestling Liger. And I went, yeah, okay, cool. Like, okay, now it is actually a thing. I thought you know, Finn was just messing with me. But yeah. um, how that all came around, it was just so odd. Because again, one, he didn't work for the company. And yep. two, it just seemed like, you know... I don't know. It's in the same category. It's like, all right, next takeover, you're going to wrestle Hulk Hogan. Okay, cool. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's not real. It's not believable. I don't believe yeah. this. And then all of a sudden it happens. You went, man, that's really cool. That is awesome though, because at that point it's like, well, wow, literally anything could happen in NXT. If Liger's coming out of literally out of nowhere to wrestle, I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. And I think that was like the, that was the cool part of like, these are can't miss shows. You've got to watch yeah. this because we're either going to give you something like that or, you know, shortly after, then all of a sudden, uh, you know, Samoa Joe came, uh, you know, all these guys that you had seen somewhere else were now in WWE and you were not only in WWE, but they were in NXT and you had to watch it because you didn't know who's coming next. And again, I think after that was, uh, you know, Samoa Joe and Shinsuke and every, every, you know, almost every takeover, Adam Cole, like every takeover, there was someone new and you go, Oh my God. Okay. I definitely can't miss the, the next one. And, you know, that was just kind of that hot streak of, of who's coming in next. Yeah, that was NXT at its best, uh, yeah. for sure. It's interesting with Triple H because, you know, people my age, I'm you know, 41 years old now, like, I think of Triple H like, okay, he's like the wrestler, wrestled Austin The Rock, he's one uh -huh. of the top guys of the Attitude Era, but guys, you know, fans after me and, and even wrestlers after me, they know him as like Papa H or like the, the guy that's <laughs> like the boss and like the, the, you know, the fatherly figure. It almost seems like he may be, which is crazy, like the perfect guy to be the head booker or the head of creative because he literally has been through every role in the company for like the last 30 years. You know what I mean? He's like the perfect guy to be the boss. Well, and it's, it's, it's not just that he's a student of the game too. So like, the stuff that he knows, it's weird. So once you start to think like, oh man, I kind of have a like a pretty good idea of of what wrestling's about and how it, you know, how a show goes together and you know, building stars and rivalries and all this stuff, you start to get an idea of what it is. And then you talk to Hunter for a second and then you go, Oh yeah, I know nothing. Like <laughs> this doesn't none of this makes sense. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, 
and so he's he's a real big like you know, again, student of the game. He's clearly a, a fan of wrestling. He clearly wants to make a difference in wrestling. You know, NXT was his vision of what developmental should be. It wasn't, it, it was, we were kind of just not squandering it, but we weren't getting the most out of it before. Um, and then all of a sudden he turned it into to NXT to where he went, yeah, there's a difference here because we can build the stars and then just more of like a lateral move over to Raw and SmackDown as opposed to like, who is this unknown guy and, and why are we, you know, caring about him as True. opposed to, again, when it got to that point, I think I was the, I was one of the early ones. Um, but, uh, maybe a year or two after me, you know, when they called up like Enzo and Cass and you have a, a raw arena singing the entire promo and song and everything else, then, you know, like, oh man, yeah, this is a, this isn't a call up. This is a, a lateral move to where we built these guys and we built these stars and they were just waiting for them to show up on Raw and SmackDown as opposed to, yeah, I, I don't know who this is. Like, where's the other guys, you know? Pretty smart because like the guy will immediately get like a good, good pop or the people will immediately know them. It's almost like back in the day where like when somebody from WCW would like X-Pac shows up, uh, you know, that's exactly it. Yeah. That's exactly it. If, if I remember, you know, and again, I love one of the biggest things for me is like, I love reactions. I love good reactions. If you get, you know, someone's music hitting or something else and people jump to their feet, I get goosebumps every time. And I remember one of the biggest ones for me was when Jericho debuted uh, with yes. the rock. And I can watch it right now and I'll get goosebumps. And it's just yep. because of how, how it was. But again, it was that WCW guy that you never thought you'd see in WWE. And all of a sudden he's in WWE and he's talking to The Rock and you're going, oh my God, what did, I don't even know how to handle this. And again, NXT at that time uh, built to that same feeling to where NXT was the WCW or whatever. And you just didn't think you were going to see these guys or you couldn't wait to see these guys or you just want to see these different interactions. And again, it was such a, there wasn't really like Raw and SmackDown people coming down to NXT at that time. So it was like two fully separate rosters um, until that moment to when you went, Oh my God, they, that's the, that's the guy, you know what I mean? And it was really cool to kind of see that. Very cool. Cause it's like almost like built in from the company. I'm going to get this guy a big pop and he's already going to be known by the fans because they watch NXT. NXT is pretty damn popular. Yeah. That was, you know, just built in competition. Yep. Um, because again, at that point, there was no competition. So it's like, you know, you only have one choice, but super smart to to build your own competition and just build that excitement. Did you like when you and, and um, Fandango got paired together as a team? Because it seemed like the perfect pairing, but some guys are like, ah, I'm, I'd rather be a singles guy. Like Michaels, for instance, I'd rather be a singles guy. Did you mind being paired up with Fandango? I know obviously the chemistry is there, but are you a singles guy or do you like being a tag guy? Um, so i would never really been in a tag team before. Like I know me and woods, uh, we tried to be a tag team, um, but we never really got, you know, our, our feet underneath us. And we never really got a chance to kind of get into the tag team world. Um, so I'd never really known if I liked tag team wrestling. Um, but I, I, I've been singles, you know, almost all the time. So I didn't really have a preference, but I really had no clue about tag team stuff at all. Unless I was randomly paired with somebody. Um, once I kind of got in my groove of Tyler breeze, I was kind of very adamant of like, I don't need, uh, I don't need a manager to talk for me. Cause I really like doing promos. Um, I don't really need, you know, a tag partner. I don't really need uh, a, a valet or anything. I, I just kind of want to, this character I built is good to go on his own and away you go. Um, and, and then when I got called up uh, and they paired me with summer right off the bat and I went, ah, like this is, we can make it work, but this, it, it, you're kind of missing the point of what this character is about. Like he's not, you know, and again, it kind of got lost in the shuffle or confused a little bit to where everyone was like, all right, like, is, are they dating or like, are they together or what's the deal? Right. And again, I'd been very strategic in how I made this character to where, you know, he didn't like girls. He didn't like guys. He loved himself. Like that was all he needed. And, you know, adding summer to it kind of really clouded that to where it was like, all right, yeah, like, how do we interact with each other? Cause in the end, Tyler Breeze didn't care about her. You know what I mean? Um, but so we, we tried what it was and everything else. And when we split up, I finally knew, you know, all right, well, it's a matter of time because, you know, Dango's a dancer and I'm a model. So they're going to see that they're kind of similar and they're just going to smash us together. And um, I knew kind of it was going to happen. But Dango, you know, he'd kind of done his own thing and we knew of each other and we were cool. But, you know, we didn't really have any intention of tagging up um, until finally – uh, they kind of tried it like once or twice and they went, yeah, we're just going to pair these guys up because they're similar. You know, they're, they're pretty boys who have, you know, dancing and model gimmicks and whatever. 
and um, they just kind of put us together. And then we we started to have fun with it to where once we started doing the fashion police stuff, it was just ridiculous. And it was like, oh man, I love tag team stuff. And and being in a tag team with him ended up being you know some of the most fun that I ever had. Um, just because of not only we grew to be pretty good friends, but we, we were just having a blast. And and once you once you figure out tag team wrestling, tag team wrestling is awesome. It is so cool if you have the right mix of stuff. And and me and Dango was just the the perfect mix of stuff. When you look at it too, it's like you guys kind of know like your chemistry together was just great off the bat. As far as like fashion police and the fashion file, mm-hmm. it's like you guys know how to play off of each other. Is that something like? that it's scripted or is it something you guys are coming up with? Is it just natural? Like how, how does that go? So a lot of it, th- this was the funny part. So they paired us together to kind of be the other guys, like the butt of the joke. I think we were just kind of, you know, we were still Fandango and Tyler Breeze, but we were kind of just like heels, you know, who just were the other, the other guys to the comedy bit of gold dust in our truth. Right. And then because of how we are like Dango's a goof, man, like Dango is just a goofy guy. And so am I. So then once you had us in these scenarios where like we're in, you know, sunburn matches or, you know, we're getting locked in tanning beds and doing all this stuff, then we just naturally kind of, you know, we're making each other laugh. And then it, it, people kind of saw it as almost like, all right, maybe there's more to like these guys than we thought. Um, And then, you know, even to the point where we, uh, I wrote the first couple uh, fashion police skits um, and, and we started doing it and we were just having fun. And then the chemistry just kind of started to go. Once you, you know, once you're around each other enough, you went, oh man, like I used to explain it where, uh, you know, when you go bowling and like they put the bumpers up, yep. Dango is like the bowling ball being thrown by a little kid and it's just wildly out of control. And I'm the <laughs> bumpers that keep us in between getting us yes. to where we need to go. Yeah. And between that combo, um, it, we end up, you know, creating what we create, but it's just so funny trying to uh, keep a straight face or, or not laugh at each other or just, you know, almost every single time I think that we finished recording a fashion files or whatever, the second they said cut, we would all burst out laughing. And it was just because, you know, uh, of how it was. And it was just, it got to be really easy um, to where you just, you didn't have, to, you didn't have to try. It was just, you were having fun. The great thing about the fashion police and the fashion files, sometimes the shows can kind of all mesh together. Like if you watch enough wrestling with the fans, it's like, oh, whatever. Of course. But you, re- you remember those because they're so like outlandish. And you're like, oh my God, that was this week. This is this. Like, you know what I mean? You yeah. kind of remember that stuff more just because it stands out so much. Well, so Tyson Kidd uh, actually had the funniest. He goes, he goes, I've never seen anything like this, man. He goes, on a wrestling show. He goes, I've never seen an audience clap like they're at a play. <laughs> and, he, and he goes, I've seen like pre-tapes and I've seen, you know, comedy stuff and he, whatever. And he goes, but literally when they see the graphic go up on the screen, they start clapping like they're at a play and then they watch and then they clap again. And he goes, I've never seen anything like it. And once I started paying attention to it, I went, oh man, he's, he's right. Like the, people are genuinely enjoying this. And, you know, it, it's one of those things where if they didn't enjoy it, it wouldn't have lasted long. Right. Um, and I remember it was specifically because of the social media reports that uh, we did one. And, uh, I think Vince hated it. He was like, I don't get it. Is this supposed to be funny? Cause I don't get it. And then they read the report back and they went, yeah. Uh, they said, you know, how social media, what was trending, all that stuff. And they said, uh, uh, fashion files was trending number one. And this was over, you know, Shinsuke, Randy Orton, all these guys that like they're stars, they're huge stars and fashion files was trending over it. And, and Vince went, okay, well let's do another one, I guess. And we did another one. And then all of a sudden he went, okay, how'd that do? And they went, yes, yeah, number one again. And then we just kept doing it for eight months because the social media was, we were trending over everything else. And, you know, even to the point where we're four or five months deep and Vince is going, I don't, why are we doing this? I hate this. And they went, cause it's number one. And he went, okay, just do it again, I guess. <laughs> and it was like, oh man, this is crazy. It's not funny though. Like obviously, you know, the boss, the main guy is yeah. like, I don't like it. It's not funny. I bet it's not doing well. No, it's the opposite. It's doing really, really well. Well, it was funny too. Cause it would really make him angry that he didn't, he didn't think it was funny. And it got to the point where we would put people in like gorilla to watch Vince, to see what he thought of it. And <laughs> they would sit there and they'd watch Vince. And when it came on, it got to the point where Vince, you know, he'd watch it and then he didn't really think it was funny. But then he'd look around and he'd see everybody else laughing. So then he'd laugh and he'd go, ha, ha, yeah. And then we go, oh my God, he's just trying to like blend into the cool crowd. Yeah. And then I think the next one was uh, finally, again, like six or seven months of this just ridiculousness that he just hates. He does not think is funny. 
And the last one, I, I remember we had somebody standing there and he's standing there and he looks around and everybody's laughing. And finally it ends and he stands up and he goes, that wasn't funny. Like, why is everybody <laughs> laughing? And they just went, oh man, this is great. Like he just, he, he hates that people are laughing at this because he doesn't think it's funny. He doesn't get it, right? Yeah, that's yeah. the problem. Yeah. He didn't get it. He didn't think it was funny at all. When you look at that, what's your favorite one that you've done? Oh man, out of every one that we did. So there was a lot of them. Uh, there was one that we did with the New Day that was really, really fun. Uh, and I remember, I think it took a million takes because like, you know, obviously the New Day from what you've seen on screen are very funny and they're very good, but like they're some of my best friends. So what you haven't seen like behind the scenes is they're even funnier. So when they, we finally got one and we went, oh man, okay. Like we've been waiting for this one. And I remember like, I just, I couldn't make it through it because between Dango being hilarious um, Biggie and everybody else, everybody's just saying stuff. And I just go, no, nah, I can't, I can't do this, man. It's too funny. And that one took a while to get through because of it was so ridiculous. Um, and I remember just finally going, man, that was like, what a good mixture of, of, you know, individuals and personalities and comedy that just, I, I really liked that one. To me, like I said, it's just memorable stuff. And that's, I mean, that's what the business is kind of about lasting memories and everybody remembers the fashion files. They may not remember, oh, you know, Nakamura and Sami Zayn match from, you know, whatever the date might That's have right. been. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they'll remember those comedy sketches because it's, it stood out. Yes. Yes. And it like, man, it was, it, we knew that it was working um, when people started to like, people really cared about us, man. Like when we came out, they really got behind us as these, you know, goofy fashion cops that, you know, at one point, again, we were on a pay-per-view wrestling for the, the tag titles and they would have been perfectly fine if we won the tag titles that night. They would have cheered yeah. their asses off. And uh, I think we knew that they were kind of starting to get behind it because we could kind of tell the reactions and stuff like that. Um, but what really clued us in was the Ascension, who, yep. you know, they they kind of got a rough, uh, you know, go of it. When when they came up, uh, they really, you know, Ascension was, was very, very uh, dominant in NXT. Yep. And when they got called up, they were one of the early ones and they kind of just got like pushed to the side, man. They got pushed to the side as just these, you know, just these guys that they do not care about. And the poor guys, like they were, so, you know, Connor and Vic were so good that, um, you know, they just couldn't get, they couldn't get anything going. They couldn't get a foothold. They couldn't get any sort of opportunity at all. They were booked all the time, but you know, you, you just knew that nothing was ever going to come of it. And when we started doing stuff with them, uh, which, you know, again, they're awesome at their stuff too. When we started doing stuff with them and, and they started turning babyface, people started loving Ascension to when we'd come out and I'd look and they would be Ascension signs and they would cheer them. And they just kind of went, oh my God, like they're, they're starting to get with us. And I went, oh man. So not only like, are they getting with us, but now they're getting with other people who are a part of the fashion. Fest. I said, man, this is great. And I remember they were just having a blast. I think they wrestled in like Costa Rica or Panama. Uh, as full baby face and they had a blast and i went man this is so cool to see because like man i just felt bad because they got screwed at every turn when they came up it is interesting like you're like okay we gotta get over and now it's like okay now we can get other people yeah. over. Yeah. yeah what a different uh you know difference as far as getting and mat maturating in the business it was yeah it was uh you know when once you realize that the fashion files turned into like almost a tool that you could help you know, people who you haven't seen these sides of them where again, like Ascension, were just kind of like the angry yelling guys. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you saw this other side to them that you went, Oh man, like I like these guys. And again, we did some stuff with them. It was so funny. I think we did a, we did a saw fashion files um, where we were all, you know, trapped in this, in this bathroom and uh, we end up getting out and like, we were jerks to them. We, we didn't save them. We let them die in there and it just worked. It, it, it was we did everything that you shouldn't do to be the baby faces and it still worked. They still, you know, forgave us and they forgave them and they just loved everything they were watching, man. I remember it was hilarious. Now you guys are getting over like, and it's funny. And then, you know, you go down to NXT, you win the tag titles, you're, you're helping the guys out down there. Were you surprised that you and Dango didn't last longer that the release happens that, you know what I mean? Like it seemed like everything was, was everything was going good. It seemed like, uh, it was, I wasn't really surprised though. So, you know, in the end, you, you, as much as we, we wrap it around wrestling and we, you know, it'd be a perfect world if everybody could have a job forever and just get paid until they die, you know, it'd be awesome, right. but it's not that way. It's a business. And, you know, unfortunately 
cuts have to come and that's just how it is. So I knew at some point, um, you know, when you're making too much money, then all of a sudden it, it, they look at you and they go, all right, man, like we, we don't need this here. And I think at that point we've been in NXT for a couple of years and, you know, NXT was still, um, considered developmental. So, you know, when you're making main roster money on NXT, it's just a matter of time. And especially at that time, um, I think a couple things were happening to where, you know, a little power struggle, a little bit different views on things. And, you know, when somebody comes in and just kind of looks at the top of the line and they go, yeah, why are these guys making this much money to be here? It's just a matter of time for you. you. You get chopped. So we knew eventually it was going to happen. Um, you know, did it have to happen? Probably not. Um, you know, is there room to bring us back? Sure. Like it's, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that again, it's just, it's the, uh, sign of the times. And again, you saw a lot of people get released at that time. Uh, Oof, we weren't, yeah. we weren't the only ones. So it, it just kind of was what it was. Are you still under any sort of deal with them now? Because you're all, are on up, up, down, down. I mean, you're, you're still doing stuff with Xavier Woods. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm still with up, up, down, down. So technically, I mean, you're not there there, but you're kind of there. And so not under a talent deal, not under a, a wrestling deal, um, but I'm under a digital deal. Oh, okay. So then obviously then that's where the indies come in and and, and doing you know, doing the independent scenes. Yep, yeah, exactly. Okay. So as far as doing up, up, down, down, like do you feel like the um video game business is almost taking over? You know what I mean? Like, it just seems like it's okay. Wrestling's a billion dollar industry, but I feel yeah. like video games might be like a you know, trillion dollar industry. You know what I mean? Almost seems like video games is just taking over the world pretty much. Well, and especially too, like, it's not even just video games. Like, it's not like, you know, video games are the catalyst or they're the part of it, but it, it comes down to more of like content creation. Um, mm. So, and even you saw, I think it was a, probably five years ago at this point, but there was actually a, a, a turn. I remember they, you know, they put it out on the news that uh, esports had actually taken over, um, you know, more of an income or more of a, you know, however you want to categorize it. Um, they had overtaken, you know, sports um, at that wow. point to where you went, oh wow, this is like an actual thing. This isn't just like, you know, a couple guys in a garage playing games or you know, a, a random underground tournament. This is we're filling arenas to to do esports and play these games and tournaments and giving away millions of dollars. Um, you know, people are winning this much. Um, so to where I think, yeah, again, it was, you know, five or 10 years ago, uh, probably more like five, um, where esports, you know, really took over. Um, and, and again, up, up, down is no different to where, again, it's, it's, a, it's about the video games, but it's not. It's more about content creation. It's more about you've seen Tyler Breeze in the ring and you've seen, you know, the wrestling version, but you've never seen outside of the ring and what he does with his friends. And same thing with Xavier Woods and same with, you know, almost everybody who's appeared on Up, Up, Down, Down. You get to see another side of them and you get to see, you know, the, the fun part of them, if you've never seen it before, or maybe you get to hear people talk that never talk on TV and you get to learn who these people are so that you care more about it. Um, you know, our biggest kind of thing being, um, you know, when we finally, uh, I think we were doing stuff with, with Claudio and Cole and myself and Woods. Um, realistically, when I go out on the independence now, I hear about, you know, four guys playing Uno more than I hear about uh, stuff that I did in the ring. And, and that's just kind of how it is to where, again, it's not it's not that people just all of a sudden love Uno. It's that they love watching the four of us play it. And right. they watched us do it for you know a year or two years or whatever it was. And again, it's it's not so much the game. It's the interaction. It's the personalities. It's, you know, it, it's it's weird to think about, you know, especially because it's, it's just me. But to some people, you're not just you. Some people, you are their, you know, Elvis, you are their Brad Pitt, you're whoever you want to say. So imagine, you know, if I'm sitting here watching, you know, Brad Pitt and Johnny Depp play a game of Uno, it's for some people that's that it's that same thing. So being being able to create that content that you'd never think you'd see, or it's a little bit more intimate, it's a little bit, you know, less uh, you know, scripted and 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 what we do. So it it, it again, it, it's kind of an inside look into something else the characters, the creativity. And then also it's like the, the chemistry people are very interested in that and, and the way you play off of each other for sure. That's exactly right. And again, like I really didn't do a whole lot in, you know, 11 years on WWE TV on NXT on Raw and SmackDown with anything with Xavier Woods. Uh, I didn't, I wasn't really in the ring with him a lot. I wasn't really in a lot of pre-tapes with him besides maybe that one or two, you know, fashion files that we did. We didn't do a lot. Um, but you know, he's one of my best friends and we talk every day and we play games and now all of a sudden people see that 
where they'd never see that before. And that's what they want. They don't care what game we're playing. They want to see the interaction uh, and, and how we are with each other and, and what we're talking about. You know what I mean? For sure. As we hit the wind down, head towards the finish here, what is next for you? What's next on the docket? What do you got coming up? Um, I don't know, man. I, it's it's kind of open at the moment. Um, you know, again, it, I opened up my calendar in September uh, to to wrestle for the first time in two years, and I had a blast. I had a blast doing the independent stuff. Um, I'm done for the year, but I've just started opening up my calendar in January. Uh, I just got some uh, some interest in doing some UK stuff, um, you know, some Australia stuff. So. Uh, a little bit more of, of just branching out and kind of, you know, revisiting these places that I kind of sped through before um, and, and just kind of enjoying it this time and, and actually taking in, you know, where I'm at. Um, so I think definitely more independent bookings, um, getting out there, doing stuff. Uh, up, up, down, down is still going. We are not, you know, slowing down anytime soon. We got more coming down the pipe. Um, we just did some stuff with Fanatics Live. Um, to where we're kind of branching into a new territory there. We just had our debut episode with me and Bailey. Um, so, you know, again, just kind of keeping that avenue open. Uh, flatbacks, we got classes going all the time. We got a class that we just started now. Um, so, you know, teaching, obviously, that that's not stopping anytime soon. Um, and it's just kind of one of those things, man. If, if, if WWE, you know, comes calling, then away you go. You, you try stuff there. It's, it's, it, it's cool having options. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it sounds so weird to talk about, like, you know, almost like I'm, I'm retired or I'm, I'm never going to wrestle again. Um, <laughs> where, you know, I'm like 35. So it's like, right. it's like, yeah, yeah. You know, like the, the cool thing about wrestling is that, you know, if WWE called me, you know, today to come back, I could be on raw and, you know, we wouldn't really miss a beat. It's not like I'm, you know, decrepit and, and, and retired. It's, it's, we're still good to go. Um, it's just a matter of timing. So, you know, again, anything's open. A uh, lot of opportunities out there. Uh, got to do some exciting stuff, and there's more exciting stuff coming. And you're a very recognizable face. So if you return, it's one of those things where, oh shit, he's back, like that kind of pop. You know what I mean? I think so. You know, I mean, like it's it's. I never really want to to bank on anything to where people would go crazy if I came back. Um, but do I think I have something to offer? Sure. Do I? You know, would it be cool to be back on NXT? Yeah, man. I love I love being able to to teach people on live TV, like teaching people how this is done and teaching people how to get better and being there, you know, not just telling them how to do it, but letting, being there to, to be hands-on with them. And, and, you know, again, you're live. So you learn as you do it live and then you come back and you go, now, do you know what they're talking about? And you go, Oh man, that's uh, okay. That's, that's what I needed. You know what I mean? I love being that person. So, uh, you know, I, I'm open to all sorts of stuff. Any sort of dream matches, any of that, or is that that doesn't really exist, or you know, that's just I don't uh, dream matches are weird for me, man. I don't know if I've ever really had any. Like, you know, obviously, the guys I grew up watching, um, that are you know, they're they're very clearly a dream match. Like, okay, I'd love to wrestle Stone Cold Steve Austin or Shawn right. Michaels or Bret Hart. Like, yes, that would be awesome, or The Rock or whoever. But at this point, um, I don't know if I have any dream matches. I, I've really got to wrestle, you know, almost everybody that I wanted to. Uh, again, the cool part about being out on the independence now is that there's guys that I haven't wrestled before. So really just kind of branching out and, and, you know, if, if something pops up that sounds exciting, I can go, yeah, yeah, let's do that. Um, uh, but I don't know if, if, you know, it's a, I'd consider it a dream match for myself. I think it would just be, you know, fun at this point to, yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah. This guy's really good. I'd like to, you know, work with him and have fun. Um, you know, I, I guess the closest thing, if I was ever going to, maybe say a, a dream match. I think a really fun match that would be, would be like me and orange Cassidy. Oh, I uh, see that. Or, or maybe, maybe Dalton castle. I think I'd put him on there too. I think that'd be kind of fun. You like those comedy guys who, who you know, they can work, but you know, like they mix it in the comedy. It's the guys that get it. The guys that get, you know, the character, but then you can also get, you know, a 20 minute match out of them. Right. Gets a mileage out of the match, but yeah, they, they're yeah. going to work the gimmick. Exactly. Now, what? Uh, where can everybody find you as far as up, up, down, down, social media, everything else you got going on? Uh, so on my socials, Instagram and Twitter, uh, I'm gorgeous with three M's. Uh, if you're looking to get into wrestling, uh, go to www.flatbackswrestlingschool.com. We got all our information on there. Um, up, up, down, down is over on WWE's YouTube channel. Uh, up, up, down, down. If you look, you'll find it. Um, 
And I think that's about it. If you download the Fanatics Live app, I'm on there as well as Tyler Breeze uh, and, and with WWE. So start following that because we've got a lot of cool, exciting stuff going on there as well. All right. Awesome stuff. Breezy, thank you so much for all the time. Really appreciate it. Of course, man. Thanks for having me.